The man who took this picture and called it Water Rats was Frank Meadow Sutcliffe. He was a dedicated pioneer of the art of photography. It was an art which cost him much wear and tear of spirit, but for Sutcliffe, nothing was too much trouble. He was a man with an obsession to record the town where he lived so completely that no corner, no cobble, no chimney, no creased face of any local character would be left out of his extraordinary catalogue. Between the 1880s and the turn of the century, he took hundreds and hundreds of photographs. They've come down to us as a prospect of Whitby. It's perhaps the most complete pictorial record ever made of one small English town before the modern world hooted its arrival in a cloud of exhaust fumes and flashing amenities. Whitby then, Sutcliffe's Whitby, was a small, isolated Yorkshire fishing town and late Victorian watering place. When Sutcliffe was setting up his camera to catch the first morning light etching out the rigging of the ships in the harbour, he too was preserving a fragment of an England that has vanished forever. An England before the coming of supermarkets and bingo halls, automats and wimpy bars. An England before dreamland. People who were young when these photographs were taken still pine for the look of things as they were then. They remember with regret this vision of the past. They know, in spite of all that's happened to make life easier, that the cost of being alive in the modern world is a huge loss of beauty like this. Such quiet pleasure for the eye and such simplicity of living didn't mean that life wasn't all so hard. The fishing fleet went out on the early tide and came back in for the morning fish auction. The fishwives came out to wait for the catch because any fish the auctioneers didn't sell, the wives themselves would hawk round the quayside. It was a hard life, and a fisherman's wife was lucky if her husband handed her over 20 shillings in one week. The fishing fleet, with its keelboats and cobbles, returned on the flood.
Each morning, the return of the fishermen was the big event, and the quayside was crowded with wives and buyers and sightseers and fish. As well as the morning fish auction, Whitby had her famous turkey market. This was the place where once a week all the farmers' wives, crammed into a rickety horse-drawn buses, came in from the Dales to sell their butter and eggs, cheese and garden vegetables. The clatter and bustle made it a natural set-piece for Sutcliffe's camera to freeze and fix forever. century the town had suddenly boomed as a whaling port and the shipyards in the upper harbour had banged and clattered with activity as Whitby turned out some of the best built wooden ships in England. Captain Cook who was a Whitby man refused to sail in any other kind. When the change came to iron and steel it became impossible to float larger ships out of the harbour unless the town built a new bridge but the town said no and at the turn of the century, Whitby's shipbuilding industry died. There seemed always to be the promise of new horizons. but nothing ever really got going. So ordinary people did what they could, adjusted to the slow pace of decline, waited on the tides. When the sea crawled out of the harbour, stranded ships lay like whales on the sands. Whitby, unlucky in its own fortunes, was a notorious hazard for mariners. But the locals could always earn an extra shilling, helping to get ships afloat again. But Sutcliffe, who had that Victorian passion for romantic scenery and picturesque events, also knew that for real interest, the human face can outlast any view. The fishermen who posed so carefully for him were the same fishing families, the Storrs, the Windspears, the Leadleys and the Hutchinsons, as those who still sail out of Whitby today. For Sutcliffe then, they looked as though they'd come straight out of a, an illustrated Dickens novel. But looking picturesque is one thing, living up to it is harder, especially when you only got sixpence to a shilling for a hundred herring in season, and not much more for cod, haddock, skate and whiting. A man had to catch a lot of fish to make a pound. And the sea asked more of him than that. crewing the Whitby lifeboat. Then even the feuding families forgot their rivalries and fought to have a place in it. For in winter, the fishermen knew fearful storms. One night in the 80s, the lifeboat was called out seven times to ships in distress. And in the morning, Whitby Strand lay strewn with wrecks. Sometimes the lifeboat crew got salvage money. You risked your life for it, but it was the best windfall a fisherman could hope for. Fishermen's wives were working members of the family team. They looked after the money. Out of 20 shillings a week, one shilling would go on rent, 12 shillings on food, 
and what they saved went to the upkeep of boats and nets and tackle. At low tide, the wives would gather driftwood to make floats for the nets, or they went out to collect cockles and mussels, which they used as bait. Then they'd set to work to bait the lines. On every line, 400 hooks, and on every hook, a mussel. A long, laborious job, and just one job in a long day's work. For Sutcliffe, setting up his camera, the girls and women out at ebb tide were figures in a seascape with the charm of heroines from an old ballad. Theirs was certainly a simple life, but it was a hard one too. Also in the 80s that they built new railway lines into Whitby and bands of navvies swarmed over the moors and dales making viaducts and cuttings to open up Whitby to the rest of the north at last. These tough working characters would sometimes take time off to pose in sedate groups, souvenirs for Sutcliffe's album. But this was also the beginning of the end of Whitby's isolation. Whitby was trying to become a holiday attraction, and soon Victorian families were arriving in force to gulp down tingling draughts of North Sea air and discover the paraphernalia of sea bathing, donkey rides on the sands clean rooms to let in Park Terrace and pleasure boats for hire and sometimes the extreme sophistication of a visiting soprano for one night only in the Westcliff Saloon. In the summertime the tradesmen prospered and they liked to stand, solid and sober, for Sutcliffe to picture them against their shop fronts and their wares. Boots were five shillings a pair, shirts cost half a crown each, a suit was twenty shillings, bread was a penny a loaf, steak fourpence a pound, eggs twenty for a shilling. tradesmen were part of a world where the values had hardly changed in a hundred years. But in the country dales outside Whitby, the creamy pastoral vision of an England of water mills and dairy farms and 18th century manor houses seemed like a paradise which had existed untouched for centuries. Sutcliffe, who was a friend of Ruskin and whose father had been a painter, composed his landscape photographs with infinite patience and an artist's eye. He worked with an old tripod camera. He prepared his own plates, and as he hunched himself up beneath the black velvet cover to keep the light out, he'd wait for the seconds to tick by while the milkmaids and the farm hands held their poses until his pictures were safely on the plate. The results of all these painstaking mechanics were a series of photographs with the curds and whey freshness of early English watercolours.
that domesticated countryside to the wildness of the inhospitable sea. These were the extremes of nature which made the background of Sutcliffe's Whitby, the town which he wanted to record so completely that nothing would be left out of the catalogue of time and seasons, from summery picnic days in the Yorkshire Dales to the wreck-strewn mornings of the Whitby winter. In Sutcliffe's Whitby, people grew old without feeling they were exiled in another world. They'd worked all their lives, and no one had come along to tell them about self-service and ready mixes, and how to serve a meal in seven seconds and threepence off, or how to stay young and slim forever. But the generations could still talk to each other, and no one had come along either to spoil the beauty of the place where they lived. For a child growing up in Whitby in the 80s, and this was before schools were free, the world was local, sharp and self-contained, bound only by the sea and the moors and working to help the family. But in the summertime, with no school to go to, unless your father wanted to pay threepence a week for you, the beach and the sea became a magical playground. A boy growing up in Whitby then, idling away in the Yorkshire summertime, would never have guessed that his town was shrinking that nothing much was going to prosper there. The whaling trade had failed, shipbuilding had died, the jet industry was finished, local fishing had never become important enough, and the tourists never came in sufficient numbers to make Whitby a great English resort. The economics of Whitby were already a problem. But for Sutcliffe, out with his camera, and for the boys who posed for him, the prospect of Whitby looked as still and bright and luminous as a fine summer morning. The 20th century hadn't arrived. Down the street. Yeah. 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 Yeah.